Well, Get Out was a thoroughly enjoyable film. Uh, it was a little, uh, I found it uneven um, and kind of like a, a big episode of Star Trek where people go to a... Well, and this could have been that. I mean, like I was saying when we left the theater, the, the concept that you go off into outer space to meet your creator and you find out that your creator wants to kill you, like that, hates you. That's a terrifying idea. It's a that, bleak concept. That's the plot to Star Trek V. Oh, the, the why would God need a starship? Yeah, yeah. What does God need with a starship? <laughs> It's true. Jim, you don't ask the Almighty for his ID. Uh, Merritt Buttrick from Star Trek II. That was Kirk's son, right? Oh, was it? I don't know. I don't know his name. I'm sorry. It was. Yeah. We all know Tom Hardy, who got his acting career started in Star Trek Nemesis as the Shinzon. Oh, Shinzon. Good old Shinzon. But instead of turning into a big thing that looked like Species 8472. And I was embarrassed. <laughs> I wonder what Denise Crosby's thinking here. <laughs> Female protagonist, male protagonist, I don't care, as long as the movie's funny. I've watched many film, especially science fiction films, with a female protagonist. Alien? <laughs> Uh, 1979? <laughs> uh, Terminator? Terminator, Sarah Connor, Captain Catherine Janeway, who is now in Orange is the New Black. In this film, Anton Yelchin stars as a member of a punk rock band that gets in over their heads when they witness a murder backstage at a club run by violent skinheads. The leader of the skinhead organization is everyone's favorite bald guy, Patrick Stewart. Patrick Stewart? Anton Yelchin? That's right, it's Chekhov versus Picard. We're getting those Star Trek references out of the way right up front, motherfucker. Mike, was Star Trek all you were going to talk about? Whoever that fucker was who read the intro stole my thunder. I don't know who it was. I don't know who reads these intros. I've been waiting years to say punk rock Chekhov versus Nazi Picard. And, and, and not it wasn't Walter Koenig. It was Anton Yelchin, the checkoff from the alternate timeline J.J. Abrams universe. It was a clash of universes, Jay. This is fanfic overload. They look like dinosaurs. They're supposed to be alligators. You know, guys, we could... It's we like could that episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh, oh God. Yeah, yeah, when they... The Barkley disease. Yeah, that turns yeah. everyone into Charles like Barkley? Was he on an episode of Star Trek? They have a little, like, prosthetic on their forehead that looks like a Klingon-like forehead. Yeah. So I think they're supposed to be aliens, but... Uh, in Star Trek, they would always try to, like, make communication with something. Especially an alien creature that that's, shows some sign of intelligence. Yeah. You'd think they would be like, okay, let's, let's do a thing while it's flopping around in this room. Let's, let's send out, uh, you know, what is it they always try to do? Prime numbers is like the basic thing of communication. I know it's just a little thing that just grew up. Sure. But you know, maybe can, maybe can understand a message somehow, at least make an attempt. And speaking of Joe Dante, Robert Picardo was in Gremlins 2 with Zach Galligan, and then Zach Galligan later appears on Star Trek Voyager. They dig out the, the big laser, the, the yeah. shoulder the, giant The BFG, cannon. absolutely. Yeah. It's Worf's purple space. It was the Are you fully functional? I am fully functional. That's a reference to Star Trek Next Generation. Does Data have sex on Star Trek? Oh yeah. That's a little weird. He never gets rapey, um, but he does have sex. He has sex. Uh, well, I'm glad he doesn't get rapey. I picked it because it stars Denise Crosby, oh. AKA uh, Lieutenant Tasha Yar, who uh, Denise Crosby made the very wise decision to leave Star Trek The Next Generation and a lifetime of royalties to star in such films as Mutant Species. She could be, she could be making like William Frakes money, Jonathan Frakes money, William Frakes, William Riker, Jonathan Frakes. I fuck that up too, I fuck everything up. You really need to take your diabetes medicine. Worf, how are you doing today? It is hot in here, but it's hot on Kronos. I see you have the traditional Klingon blade. Yes. And I had just a moment to ask him an important question. Now today, did you happen to bring your purple space bazooka? My what? Your, your giant purple space bazooka that you shoot in Star Trek Insurrection. No, I left that back on the show. 
he was he was wonderful in this. Yeah. I was I'm glad to see Data back. He even said the word sick bay. Mm. It's like I gotta get you to sick bay. Yeah. And, and I'm like, my heart skipped a beat. <laughs> I'll make a point to reference Star Trek The Next Generation, the best of both worlds. Captain Picard has been controlled by the Borg. He's been re retaken back by the Enterprise crew. And he says, sleep, Data, sleep. And then, and then stupid Beverly Crusher says, he must be exhausted. And then Data's like, no, no, bitch. <laughs> he's, he's trying to tell us a course of action. Mm. Put the Borg to sleep via a subcommand, which is very similar to, to sending in a, a virus and then they put all the Borg to sleep. They trick them into thinking it's time to regenerate. Okay. But in order to make it exciting, for some reason, the self-destruct starts happening on the Borg cube <laughs> and then it blows up. Mm. So I can't be hypocritical. I understand why they just didn't say the virus turned all the ships off and they all just crashed. Right. I have to concede this notion. Best of both worlds would not have ended very excitingly if but you could. the board ship just shut off and they went to sleep. Oh, God, that was Cassie O. Cassie O keyboard. Keyboard. Was, yeah. It's Cassian Andor. And I remember that because his name sounds like Calrissian Andor. 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 Yeah. And, uh, uh, that's a Star Trek reference. But Endor. Andor, Endor, sure. It sounds I'm thinking, like Endor. We're Star a, Trek people, so. There let's... is a planet called Andor, and the, which has the Andorians, which are the blue people with the t antenna. But then there's a planet of Endor that has the Ewoks. That starts with an E. Sure. That's always been the strongest stuff in any of these movies, whether it's them or whether it's uh, those two old guys. Oh, yeah. Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart. Is that their names? Have they yeah. done anything else? They've been in some things. Mm. Offhand, I can't recall what. Okay. Some kind of like bigger sci-fi series or series of films. Oh, sci-fi. Uh, uh, Patrick Stewart was in Life Force. Yes. And I never saw Terminators as like, like Data's, you know, like Brent Spiner Data. Like I saw them as just mindless killing robots. But yeah. for some reason, he's as smart as Data and he could build a fucking time machine. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when Data traveled back to uh, San Francisco in the 1890s? and met Mark Twain. Data was also building some sort of device out of technology at the time to communicate to the future. But Data could do that because he's smart. Um, that was in the, the two-parter episode, Time's Arrow. Um, uh, I'm sick. Jordy, get back. <gasps> His name's Jordy and he's blind. Yeah. Can we talk about Jordy? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, if we're talking about Her uh, kid brother in the film is named Jordy. And he pretends to be blind. Which must have really just really just rubbed salt in Denise Crosby's wounds. They they uh, Picard Picard. Shit. <laughs> um, we talk about the Star Trek guy and the you Star go ahead. Trek. Well, there's multiple Star Trek things. Yeah. The, 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 there's a guy in this film, he plays the police chief. Me and Rich are like, we know that guy. We know that guy. He's from something. He's from something. And He's the, the episode where Wesley Crusher and three <laughs> other cadets um, get tried for a crime. They're, 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 hot, they're pilots. They're on a piloting mission in the academy, and they do a dangerous maneuver. That's, that, that's the episode that has Tom Paris, who isn't really Tom Paris. Although his backstory lines up perfectly with Voyager, so he should have been Tom Paris. He was going to be, but then they would have had to have given the writer of that episode royalties oh, for the Voyager show. But a... originally, it was going to be. But anyways, um, oh, oh. Yeah, well, we're still talking about stuff. Okay, I'll be, I'll be um, That same court martial scene, you'll find, you'll find Marina Sirtis. And uh, Marina Sirtis plays Counselor Jim Troy. Are we talking about Marina Sirtis and how she violently gets raped in this movie? Yes. Scientist Man, mm -hmm. who is the same actor who played Admiral Dougherty in Star Trek Insurrection, which should be noted. But he wants to conquer the Federation, so this is a Star Trek. So oh, all right. You're gonna, you're gonna love this. Hello, I am also wearing a Spock t-shirt. I see we're doing the presence thing again. He's basically Ed 209, where you know if you step out of line even a little bit, you're dead. It reminds me of that episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, when they accidentally create Professor Moriarty. Well, they say they create him on accident. They create a supervillain on accident. In the episode, they, Jordy and Data are playing on the holodeck, right? And they're playing their, they're playing their, their, um, 
uh, the Sherlock, uh, Holmes. Sherlock Holmes adventures, and Data keeps solving all the cases too quickly. So uh, Jordy says, computer, create a, uh, an enemy, or create an opponent, an adversary, that uh, is capable, is of, capable defeating of, data. of defeating data. And so the computer interpret that, interprets that to, to create something that's smarter than the computer itself. We want to be really smart to defeat data. I really liked the part where uh, Black Widow was riding on Hulk's back as they climbed up the floating city. That was great. But Jay, I don't know anything about video games or video game systems. I mean, look at this. This looks like something a Vorto would wear in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I don't know what that means. Just remember, I can smell your c**ts. No, I don't. This room. Uh, What's that from? Mike? Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Oh. I, well, what, what part it's of the also in it? Silence of the Lambs. Are you Billy sure Foster's that wasn't the porn parody? Star Trek Three: The Search for Cock. It wasn't really the ghost taking control. It was the ghost possessing David from Star Trek Two: The Wrath of Khan. <laughs> like the ship has a, the spaceship has sort of this organic thing yeah. going on where it looks like it's made of like bone and like honeycomb and webbing, and I was like, why is it like this? Yeah, the, yeah. The sets like lots of. Curtains. The doors are like shower curtains, and yeah. then and then it's like, um, uh, yeah, every it's, it it looks like 1960s Star Trek sets for a while. <laughs> like one of those cheapo romantic comedies that they dump into theaters every February. I think Simon Pegg may have been making a reference to Tuvix. I don't know how much si Simon Pegg knows about Star Trek. I know he's a big Star Wars guy. I have a feeling he watched every Star Trek show in in order. To, I'm, I'm going to assume he knows more than Robert Ortsy and Robert Kurtzman. He looks like Khan. Uh, he has oh, Khan uh, here. Look, just shut the fuck up and keep eating the cake. Oh, I'm trying to read this classic American novel. Oh, is that one by Hemingway? Uh, close. Michael Jan Friedman. Oh, I loved him on Airwolf. Like, okay, I get what they're going for here with yeah. the Judy Dench M character and James Bond himself getting sort of older and, and not quite used to this yeah. uh, type of world that we are in now. It's very, it's very Star Trek II. Oh. Uh, very revenge oriented. Uh, the lead character is aging and realizes it and, you know, kind of has a rejuvenation at the end. It was, it was. Picard was brainwashed in a different dimension. It's like the episode where Benjamin Sisko is, is a crime writer in the 1940s on Star Trek Deep Space Nine! Was that a plot line? I think so. There's many episodes of many series of Star Trek where one of the characters is out of time, out of place, in, uh, in a different world where their memories are wiped and they're doing something completely different that normally do and so-and-so is a bad guy. There's, of course, the Mirror Mirror Universe in Star, Star Trek, the original series, and which carries over into Deep Space Nine. Oh, of course. They bring back the Mirror Mirror Universe in Deep Space Nine, yeah. where everyone's fucked up and evil, and some people are, most people are. Um, and so I, I, the whole time I watched this film, I was, just, I was just thinking, like, this is great. This is a great Star Trek episode? Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, I kept, I kept wanting to hear Patrick Stewart say, throw the phaser under the door. They made a joke about uh, uh, McCoy and Spock being melded together once they beam back. Oh yeah, that made me think of David Cronenberg's The Fly. Was that a Star Trek reference? Well, yeah, and, and um, uh, uh, Scotty goes, That's not, that would be the worst thing that would happen. It was the worst idea ever or something like that. And there was a Voyager episode where Neelix, the happy-go-lucky uh, Hobbit character, uh, and Tuvok, the you know, emotionless Vulcan, yeah. get blended into a, a, a new being called Tuvix. Oh my god. And uh, they're like, Tuvix is its own thing, you know? We can't tell it to separate. He's like, I like myself now, I'm Tuvix. <laughs> and uh, they're like, we can't force it to come back apart. It's a new person, <laughs> what do we do? I don't know. All those ethical, there's lots of ethical questions in Star Trek. That's what makes Star Trek fun, is all the ethical questions. So many good, good shows uh, dealing with that. When I saw the helmet and Paul Rudd has to go to open it up, I thought, and, and I gave the movie too much credit, uh, I thought he needed to use it to breathe mm. because 
there's an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine where they discover a, a, a anomaly in space that will, if you pass through it, it will shrink down your molecules. And Chief O'Brien, Lieutenant Jadzia Dax, and Dr. Julian Bashir get into a little tiny shuttlecraft. Well, it's not tiny then, it's a regular sized, it's a runabout. And they pass through the thing and they shrink. And they shrink to about this big. And um, they fly around inside the Defiant. It's really, it's a really great episode. It's pointless, <laughs> but they're like, we got to go get out of the ship and and fix something. And then the doctor's like, no, no, you can't because when you breathe outside of the ship, the mo the oxygen molecules are too large for your blood to mm. assimilate them, so you'll suffocate to death. So I thought, hey. and you wanted that kind of science and. Ant-Man? Oh, hey, where's Mike? Oh, yeah, that's weird. Hmm. Oh. oh. Well, that was that was clever and inventive and unique. Yeah. I beamed in because of Star Trek. Yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. I also brought along my phaser weapon. You know, that's just a plastic toy, right? And it's from Next Gen. What? What does that mean? Spock has a phaser because of Star Trek. Dork. That's the wrong phaser. <sighs> Shit. You, you done? Yeah. It definitely is breast cancer. The movie then happens. It stars no one you've ever heard of except for Alfre Woodard, who is in Star Trek First Contact. Mike wrote this. Or more importantly, Jay, how are people going to play their Star Trek The Next Generation interactive VCR board game? Oh my god. He looks like the guy that plays um, an admiral in Star Trek Voyager. Okay. Uh, admiral Paris. And he think, looks like Mr. Magoo. Do you ever think that maybe you draw too many comparisons to Star Trek? What was really enticing was Star Wars. The motion picture. And yeah, and they made a Star Wars holiday special. They never called it Star Wars the motion picture. They called it Star Trek Star the Star Trek the motion picture. Which came out in 1979, came out two years after Star Wars. But it was more influenced by Stanley Kubrick's 2001 for some reason. Gene Roddenberry and Robert Wise, who directed Star Trek the motion picture, were stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make a fucking two and a half hour boring movie. <laughs> and not ape off the success of this amazing action-packed sci-fi adventure called well, Star but, Wars. But when, 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 when Star Trek apes off of S Star Jesus. Wars, you get you get J.J. Abrams' Trek. They did that. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. No, J.J. Abrams' Trek was fine. The first one, it just the wasn't second a, one. just wasn't it, a Trek movie. No, no, it's not a Trek Rich, movie. Rich, it's perfectly in Spock's character to jump onto a <laughs> flying hover vehicle. <laughs> And punch somebody <laughs> repeatedly. And punch someone repeatedly in the face. While yes. screaming emotionally. While screaming, I'm gonna murder you, you <laughs> cocksucker. I'm gonna apologize in advance to you and our audience. I'm gonna bring up Star Trek. Okay. Starship Troopers is, is the anti-Star Trek. Hmm. Um, because Starship Troopers is essentially the Gorn episode called Arena in Star the famous Trek. Gorn the famous Gorn episode. I don't know if you remember the first the Gorn fight is a small part of it. There's That's a, all anybody knows. Okay. The first part of it, Kirk and, and, and the gang, um, it's an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, Kirk and the gang go to a Federation planet where everyone's been murdered. So in the Gorn episode, the Enterprise goes to a planet uh, with Federation colonists and they discover they've all been killed, much like what happens in Starship Troopers. Uh, same thing happens in, uh, in the arena episode, and everyone's killed, and they kind of figure out who did it. It's the Gorn. They're a hostile race. They look like something that's ugly to us, like the bugs. Right. And so, you know, they chase, they chase the, the Gorn ship. I mean, it's intervened. They're intervened by, like, these, these Greek god aliens that are, like, all-powerful, and they're basically like, you're, you're fighting in our territory. Stop. Here's our solution. You and the Gorn 
Captain Kirk and the Gorn Captain are going to go down on the planet and fight. Whoever wins, we're going to blow the other ship up. But in the end... I shall be merciful and quick. You were intruding. You established an outpost in our space. Kirk realizes that the Gorn was just doing exactly what the bugs did. Yeah. We set up a colony on, on its Protecting planet. Protecting its territory. Yeah, and so he's like, no, I'm not going to kill him. I won't kill him! And then everyone's on their little earpiece, the Lieutenant Uhura earpiece from Star Trek. <laughs> it was a callback to Scott Bakula Enterprise. Oh, really? Well, it's the same, basically the same design, like okay. an X-Class ship. Uh, and that was so cool to see that. <laughs> well, surprisingly, the, the musical composer of Space Raiders, a, a B-movie made by Roger Corman, yeah. was the famous James Horner. Yeah. And if you don't know who James Horner is, he composed music for many films, uh, the Star Trek films. But, but notably, notably, Star Trek two II and three. Mm -hmm. People on fifty colonized planets are waiting for shipments, and we've got robots sitting on their hands. We're the biggest corporation in the galaxy. Oh, we can at least get a shipment off on time. It sounds like Star Trek three music. Yes, and there's a lot of music that Rich and I noticed was very similar to Star Trek Three: The Search for oh, Spock. Even I noticed. Like, the feel is very similar. These films were made right, right, right around the same time. Yeah. Yeah, if James Horner wasn't dead, we'd call him out on plagiarizing himself. I guess it, we still are, but... Well, it's, it's not necessarily plagiarism, but it feels like offcuts. Like rough tracks and demos yeah. and kind of, although, which is not to say the quality of recording because it's definitely like fully orchestrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, has the Star Trek music in it. <laughs> and I don't know. Is this the same score? Yeah. It's the same score with like, like slight variations on a couple of the notes. Okay, someone out there has to have also noticed this <laughs> because that, they played that same theme. It's like the new Star Trek theme. Uh, in the J.J. Abrams movies. Okay. And it's the exact same music in this. Mr. Cruz requires a 30-foot distance between him <laughs> and the lens. <laughs> It'll be like old episodes of Star Trek whenever you see him, where it cuts to, like, like Dr. McCoy, and it's, like, perfectly in focus, and it cuts to a lady of a certain age, and it's, like, blurry. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta put that old timer filter on. <laughs> We're filming a lady, gentlemen. <laughs> Let me get this straight. The lady from Star Trek First Contact throws herself out of a window to save <laughs> my baby's soul from being eaten by the devil which is inside a plastic doll. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Americans and their trash. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, there's, that's not a name. That's just like a word that they yeah, made up. It sounds like a mixture of Nomad, the, mm -hmm. the autonomous uh, robot from the original Star Trek series, and NORAD. Yeah. Yep, because that sounds ominous. They did the swarm in Star Trek Voyager. Tens of thousands of tiny ships uh, attacking you at once is an interesting concept, and the Voyager didn't do anything with it. Mm. I'm glad they brought that back. Uh, his skin has been burnt off. And so he's a robot, so he says, I'll meet you there. Wait, stop. Oh my God. Okay, I've seen plenty of episodes of Star Trek or shows like that. You, you watch Star Trek? I have watched Star Trek. And this is the first I'm hearing of this. Uh, the show that takes place aboard the Star Trek Enterprise with Dr. Spock, where these, there's these convoluted time, time travel shows, right? Okay. We gotta go back here to stop this and that and that. And then there's all sorts of things in it. Butterfly, butterfly effect, effect. Uh, causality loops, uh, you kill your grandparents. Paradoxes. You, paradoxes, whatever. But at the core, as long as there is a heart to the story, is there a heart to this story? No. And that's the main problem. I can only pray uh, that they don't dredge them back up because this, Oh, that would be like a slap in the yeah. face of this movie. This was like the end of Star Trek VI, uh, The Undiscovered Country. Yeah. The Enterprise sails off we're into done. the sunset. We're done. Oh no, we're bringing Kirk back. Uh, second start, start of the right. right. <laughs> straight, straight on until morning. morning. Dun, 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 dun. And then the, and every cast member signs the credits. And then they, then they bring them back! <laughs> Come on out of the graves, everybody! Yeah. Let's ruin everything! We'll leave it alone.
let's take a look here. Is it embarrassing that I know his name is Galron? Yes. I thought so. That's nice. 